It's not so very long ago that people still entertain the idea of intelligent beings on Mars. If you think back to the films that were being made in the 1950s, they still took as their theme this uh, possibility of invaders from the red planet. And if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, scientists and astronomers were debating this possibility of uh, advanced life on Mars, at least in the form of vegetation or primitive animal life, and also that in the past uh, Mars may have had a, an advanced civilization. All of this speculation sprang from the possibility that Mars had water, and more than that, that it may have had a system of artificial waterways that some astronomers believe they could see through their telescopes. The canals of Mars, and that's the subject of my video today, the canals of Mars. The saga of these elusive waterways began with claims by the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli following his observations of the opposition of Mars in 1877. Mars is a tough planet to study by telescope because it's so small and the best times are when it's closest to us at so-called opposition. That's when Earth lies more or less exactly between Mars and the Sun. Schiaparelli believed he could see straight lines crisscrossing the planet and he used the Italian word canali to describe the linear markings that he thought he could see in 1877 and at subsequent oppositions. He drew increasingly elaborate maps in which the canali became a more and more prominent feature, even seeming to double on a seasonal basis, a phenomenon that became known as gemination. On balance, he favoured the view that they were natural waterways, although he never argued much against the suggestion that they might have been intelligently constructed. To add to the confusion, the Italian word canali can be translated as channels, natural or artificial, or as canals. Schiaparelli often used the alternative term fiumi, meaning rivers for the features he thought he could see, but not surprisingly, canali was usually translated into English as canals, implying that they'd been built. To begin with, Schiaparelli got little encouragement from the astronomical community. Observers of the caliber of Asaph Hall, who discovered the two tiny moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, and Edward Barnard, discoverer of Amalthea, a faint inner satellite of Jupiter, never saw linear markings on the red planet. In 1894, Barnard wrote, I have been watching and drawing the surface of Mars. It is wonderfully full of detail. There's certainly no question about there being mountains and plateaus. To save my soul, I can't believe in the canals as Schiaparelli draws them. I see details where he has drawn none. I see details where some of his canals are, but they are not straight lines at all. When best seen, these details are very irregular and broken up. I verily believe that the canals are a fallacy and that they will so be proved before many favorable oppositions are passed. Barnard's sceptical stance represented the majority position of professionals throughout the period of the canal debate. Yet, enough reputable astronomers did come out in support of Schiaparelli's canali to keep the controversy alive. What's more, Schiaparelli's reputation as a skilled observer was such that, even among opponents, his claims concerning the mysterious lines were treated with respect, and Mars became the subject of intense scrutiny at the world's leading observatories. Several matters needed resolving, both intellectually and optically. First was the question of whether there really were lines on Mars at all. Many astronomers doubted it, suspecting there were an illusion. But verification of Schiaparelli's markings came in 1886 from the French astronomers Henri Perrotin and Louis Tholon at Nice and Herbert Wilson in Cincinnati. Next was the question of whether if the lines were real, they were watercourses or some other phenomenon, such as glacial crevasses or 
stripes due to differences in vegetation. The last suggestion was made by American astronomer William Pickering in 1888 and won considerable support. Finally came the question of whether if the canals were waterways they were natural or artificial. Although the latter view won very little support among professional astronomers, it proved irresistible to the general public, whose imagination was fired by the pro-canal writings of Camille Flammarion in France, and especially of Percival Lowell in the United States. In his widely read and translated La Planète Mars, 1892, Flammarion wrote, it would be wrong to deny that Mars could be inhabited by human species whose intelligence and methods of action could be far superior to our own. Neither can we deny that they could have straightened the original rivers and built a system of canals with the idea of producing a planet-wide circulation system. Even Flammarion's enthusiasm, however, paled beside that of Lowell, who, from 1894 to his death in 1916, painted a picture of an extant Martian civilization infinitely more alluring than the prosaic, yet more accurate, portrayals by mainstream science. Lowell managed to capture the mood of the age by the closing decades of the 19th century through a bombardment of extraordinary fact and fiction people had become habitualized to high-speed technological progress and increasingly ambitious civil engineering schemes so the suggestion that beings on another world more evolved than mankind might be able to carry out projects on a planet-wide scale seemed perfectly credible what humans could do perhaps the martians older and wiser could do bigger and better. Regarding transport systems, for instance, the year 1869 saw not only the term canali first applied to a feature on Mars, but also the opening of the Suez Canal and the completion of the first rail track linking the east and west coasts of the United States. Ordinary folk were primed, ready to believe in advanced Martians, so that when Lowell speculated about a canal-building super race, he found an eager and sympathetic audience. Many people felt the haunting, otherworldly allure of the Martian canals, and novelists were not slow to weave romantic tales around the theme, further stimulating public interest. Percy Gregg, George Griffith, Garrett Service, H.G. Wells, with his War of the Worlds, and others at the end of the 19th century, Edgar Rice Burroughs in the early decades of the 20th and more recently Robert Heinlein in Red Planet 1949 and Stranger in a Strange Land 1961 and Ray Bradbury in the Martian Chronicles 1950 drew inspiration from the Lowellian myth because myth is what it proved to be. By the dawn of the 20th century it was becoming clear that the Martian atmosphere was too thin, the temperature too low and water too sparse to support any kind of life except possibly primitive vegetation and microbes. Hopes of finding canals or their builders had all but disappeared. Edgar Rice Burroughs, best known for his Tarzan books, also wrote a series based on the adventures of John Carter on Mars. A vision of Mars that brought to life the Lowellian myth of canals and a thriving alien civilization. One of the songs I've written is based on Burroughs' novel, The Princess of Mars, and here's a link to it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you like what you saw, and I'll see you again soon for more adventures in space, time, and music.